Welcome friends, colleagues, and students. Um, there's an eerie quality to our discussion today and the backdrop tonight to what we're going to talk about. We're about to be guided through a story of violence against civilians in cities and towns that may have become newly familiar to people. Kiev, Praskurev, which is today Khmelnytsky, Kharkiv, Zhitomir, to name a few. This violence took place in the context of the end of World War I, the Russian Civil War, and the Polish Soviet War, when the borderlands between the former Austrian and Russian Empire became brutal battlegrounds over the political and ideological direction of Europe. And I know our guest will say more about this and provide us with important context, but one of the interesting aspects of this current crisis is the extent to which historical memory and the distortion of historical memory has been at the center of the conflict itself um, and, and possibly the motivations uh, of its actors. Another interesting aspect is that despite the temptations that we may have to focus on historical resonances between our topic tonight, uh, 100 years ago, anti-Jewish violence uh, in what is today Ukraine during the Russian Civil War, uh, and the brutal conflict going on in Ukraine today, what is very interesting is also how much has changed. Uh, how much has changed about Ukrainian identity, what it means to be Ukrainian, um, and what Ukraine is uh, even in the past 30 years, uh, let alone in the past 100 years. Uh, so much so that the current hero of the moment to many um, is a person who describes his childhood, and I'm talking about the President Volodymyr Zelensky, as being in a typical Soviet Jewish family. And this is the patriotic hero of Ukraine uh, at the moment. Um, I can't think of a, a better person to take us through some of this historical context, which is so important right now for understanding our current moment, um, than Professor Jeffrey Weidlinger. Uh, Jeffrey Weidlinger is Joseph Brodsky Collegiate Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's former director of the Frankel Center for Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. Um, he is the author, author of four books. The book we are going to hear about tonight, uh, In the Midst of Civilized Europe, The Pogroms of 1918 to 1921, and The Onset of the Holocaust, um, being his fourth. Uh, and I've had the privilege of following his literary career uh, from the beginning uh, with a book on the Moscow uh, State Yiddish Theater in the 1920s, and then a book on Jewish public culture in the late Imperial Russian Empire, um, and then a, a large oral history project that became a book on Soviet Yiddish ethnographies uh, with sort of the last generation of Soviet Yiddish, of Yiddish speakers, um, and this massive ethnographic oral history project uh, that Professor Weidlinger conducted, uh, and finally, this really masterpiece on um, the significance of anti-Jewish violence during the Civil War for understanding um, what would take place during the Second World War um, and after within the Soviet Union. Uh, Professor Weidlinger and I are also personally connected. Um, this is actually quite special for me. Um, we both are from Toronto. And for, for those of you who attended uh, virtually or in person um, the Menachem Kaiser event, you might be saying, does he ever invite anybody who's not from Toronto? <laughs> it's purely a coincidence, I assure you. Um, uh, but we were both from Toronto, and we both did our undergraduate uh, degree at McGill. Um, and Jeff was a person who, he's a little bit older than me, and when I was at McGill, uh, uh, studying the same things that he had studied a few years before, um, I could tell my girlfriend at the time and my parents, hey, look, you can actually become a professor of Russian Jewish history, um, because he had become safely ensconced at Indiana University and, um, and had made it. Um, so that was an, an inspiration for me. Um, there was also uh, a 
uh, a favorite moment of mine um, that I think is actually uh, telling about his prescience, um, which is that I started uh, my I started graduate school at McGill University, um, and then I eventually came to Boston and went to Brandeis and finished my uh, graduate education here. But when I was in my first or my second semester of graduate school, uh, I TA'd a class on Soviet history. Um, and the professor, this was a, over 200 students in the class, and it was another TA and me. And, and he really just gave us the keys to his office for the final exams and said, lock it when you're done. He didn't even, didn't even look at them. So we spent hours and hours in this office bored uh, reading exams, but also <laughs> rummaging through his papers. And there was a letter from an undergraduate student that was a few years old that said, Dear Professor Boss, uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to finish our earlier debate, but I must insist you are wrong in your interpretation of, of Soviet history and the future of Russia. And in this letter, this undergraduate student who was uh, a senior and was graduating and, and sent a final letter. Yes, at the time people wrote letters by hand and, and sent them to their professors, uh, challenged this, uh, this professor's rosy interpretation of Soviet history and the trajectory of Russia, which he believed to be on, the professor believed to be on a, an increasingly liberal and optimistic path. And this young undergraduate student, whose name was Jeffrey Weidlinger, uh, insisted that there was less reason for optimism than this professor suggested. Um, so, I, like I said, I can't think of a better person to come to talk to us today uh, and make those, uh, make those connections. And I love uh, bugging Jeff about that, uh, <laughs> that story today. Um, and he has maintained his posture in um, challenging sacred cows that need to be challenged and, um, and engaging in intellectual debate uh, over the trajectory of uh, Russian and Jewish uh, history. Um, so before I pass things on to Professor Weidlinger, I want to thank the continued support of the Morton and Giesen families uh, for supporting uh, the programming of the Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Committee at Northeastern University. Uh, this is a committee which I chair, and I'm only now realizing that I did not introduce myself at the beginning of this introduction. Uh, and my name is Simon Rabinovich, and I teach uh, history and Jewish studies at Northeastern. I chair the university's Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Committee um, under the auspices of which we have invited Professor Feidlinger along with um, the History Department at Northeastern University. Um, I'd like to thank the College of Social Sciences and Humanities for its com continued support and that of its dean, uh, Uta Poiger. Uh, the members of the Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Committee who devote a lot of their time to organizing the programming, and my colleagues in the History Department and in Jewish Studies, and in particular, uh, my greatest partner in crime, Professor Lori Lefkowitz, uh, who is director of the Standard for Jewish Studies and the Ruderman Chair, holds the Ruderman Pe Chair in Jewish Studies. Um, finally, um, I would like to thank Deborah Leviston for her hard work in uh, making this event possible. And Professor Weidlinger, the floor is yours. But you have a... I have my own little microphone. <laughs> yeah. So everybody can hold their, their questions until the end, and then I will moderate it, and I will, I'll bring the mic around for anybody who would, who would like to ask a question. Hey, thanks, Simon. And I think you can all hear me with my microphone. Um, so thank you, Simon, and thank you, uh, Deborah, and thanks, everybody, for making it possible for me to be here. And thank you for being here. And thank you to those of you who are watching from home and aren't here. Um, but are here in a different form. Um, so nice to see you all. Um, and Simon, thanks also for that introduction. I don't remember writing that letter that you mentioned, but I do remember having those sentiments. And I got to say, I was right on that. And you know, it's unfortunate that I tend to be a pessimist and predict the worst. Um, it's also unfortunate that I tend to be right. <laughs> 
And this is another case of that. I also have to say it's unfortunate um, that uh, whenever, you know, I'm a historian of Holocaust genocide studies of mass murder in Europe, and it's also unfortunate when what I am teaching and what I write about suddenly becomes relevant. And it is very relevant right now. And the places that I wrote about in this book, as Simon mentioned, um, place names, actually a review of the book in the Times of London commented, nobody's heard of any of these places. Uh, they're actually all on the front pages of the New York Times right now um, because they are being bombed um, by Russian invaders. So I just want to say that my thoughts are very much with the Ukrainian people um, who are undergoing these atrocities right now. Um, Ukraine is currently a democratic and pluralistic country that is striving to be a normal country. It's had a difficult past. It's had a very difficult uh, hundred year past. And even since independence has struggled to get to the point that it is now. Um, but since 2019, at least, it has been a fair democracy. In fact, they had an election, and this is not the top of my talk, but while I'm on it, since uh, because of what's going on today, they had an election in 2019 for the president. And Volodymyr Zelensky won. Uh, beating Petro Poroshenko. And you know what happened? Petro Poroshenko ceded power peacefully and handed power over to the next president. Uh, that's a democracy, and you know, that's the type of democracy that we today in the United States, I think, only dream that we could have, uh, where the president cedes the, uh, cedes the election to, uh, to the person who won the election. So they're doing well and they're struggling, and it's precisely that democracy uh, that is the reason for this war. Uh, Putin has said in his various speeches that he is invading Ukraine because he's trying to denazify it. Uh, Ukraine is not a Nazi state by any stretch of the imagination. It does have a past that is tainted with Nazism and it does have neo-Nazi organizations within it, as do all states in Europe and, by the way, in America. And you know, the last 10 years or so, I've seen a rise in neo-Nazi and far-right organizations in Europe, in Ukraine, and in America. Um, but they have very little parliamentary representation, and they are, don't really play much of a role in public life in Ukraine right now. Um, so Putin is not afraid of Nazism coming out of Ukraine. Putin is afraid of democracy coming out of Ukraine because he knows that Ukraine and Russia do have a lot of similarities. They're not the same country, contrary to Putin's wishes, um, but they do have a lot of similarities. They speak the same language. They grew up on the same TV shows. They uh, laugh at the same jokes. They have similar cuisine. They're sim they have a shared history together. Um, but what he's afraid of is that if democracy works in Ukraine, which it seems to be doing, then it can also work in Russia. And that's the biggest threat that he faces. So that's why we're seeing the bombing of the places that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, and you know, one of the lessons of the book that I've written is violence begets violence, and violence has a legacy. Uh, my book is about pogroms in 1918 to 1921, but specifically about how they contributed the seeds or laid the seeds or contributed uh, the, the groundwork for the Holocaust 20 years later. And I think it's important to remember that violence has a legacy, that 20 years later, violence begets violence, um, and bloodletting hastens the next bloodletting. And we are now, once again, uh, in Europe, witnessing a bloodletting. And you know, I don't want to think about what it's going to hasten next, uh, so to put that on the table. Um, I grew up, and maybe this is where that pessimism that Simon mentioned that I expressed in college comes from, that I continue to express today. I grew up the son of a Holocaust survivor. And you can see this picture, my father on my grandfather's lap, on his father's lap. This picture was taken in Budapest, 1944. And it looks like a happy father and son. They're on the balcony of their apartment, laughing and smiling and posing for a photograph. And maybe it takes you a minute to notice that they're both wearing yellow stars, that this is Budapest under Nazism. And in fact, we have many family photos like this of my father wearing a yellow star. My father always talked about his childhood in Hungary uh, and talked about how normal, what a happy childhood he had. 
how everything seemed, seemed normal. He would go on vacations to Lake Balaton and go skiing in the Alps, and he took fencing lessons and uh, would go to synagogue nearby every, every week and went to Hebrew school. Uh, basically, you know, a normal Jewish childhood, a peaceful Jewish childhood. And he always said that what happened in 1944 that the, in Hungary or what happened earlier elsewhere, the Holocaust, was completely unimaginable and unpredictable, that nobody could have imagined that something like this was going to happen. And in fact, that's a lesson that we get in a lot of places. If you read you know, the two most famous accounts of the Holocaust, Elie Wiesel's Night and Anne Frank's Diary, I think in both of those, you get the impression that it was completely unimaginable. These are both written by, well, Anne Frank was living a typical you know, middle-class life in Frankfurt until she had to suddenly flee Frankfurt for Amsterdam. And Elie Wiesel grew up in a religious village, a religious small town in Sigat Marmarish in Romania, uh, and was living there until the Nazis came to Romania, came to his town over the summer of 1944, late in the war, and set up a ghetto, and soon uh, expelled the population to Auschwitz. So both of them talk about this normal life. And in fact, there's a Holocaust Memorial Museum near where I live in Farmington Hills, Michigan. And when you enter that museum, there's a big open room that shows Jewish life in the interwar period. And you can walk around, and there's one, one, uh, one, exhibition on, um, one exhibition on Jewish religious life. And there's a scene of a, of a bunch of people around a Sabbath table. And then there's another about the diversity of newspapers in multiple languages, uh, Jewish newspapers throughout Eastern Europe. Another on Jewish youth activities and sports organizations and what have you, all showing how ordinary life seemed. And then at this museum, you turn a corner and there's a long, narrow hallway that leads down, uh, that slopes down. And at the very bottom of the ha hallway is a huge portrait of Adolf Hitler. And it gives the impression that everything suddenly changed on a dime. That, again, the Holocaust was unimaginable until Hitler came along and changed everything. Now that narrative is true. That actually is how a lot of people in Western Europe and Central Europe experienced the 20th century. Um, but in Eastern Europe, particularly in Ukraine, there's a very different history. And I think that we as historians have neglected the role that this particular history played in the 20th century and played in the Holocaust. That's between 1918 and 1921. There were about a thousand separate pogroms, separate incidents of mass murder, massacres, ethnic riots of Jews in about 500 different towns that led in the end to the death of about 100,000 people. About 100,000 Jews were killed in this. About 40,000 were killed at the time, and another 60,000 died subsequently of their wounds or of starvation or of exposure as a direct result of the pogroms. It wasn't the first wave of pogroms in the area. There was another wave of violence in 1881-82 in which about a dozen or so people were killed and another wave of violence between 1903 and 1906 in which about three to 5,000 people were killed. But the wave of violence between 1918 and 1921 again resulted in the deaths of 100,000 people. And we hadn't talked about this. Um, even as historians, even as a historian of Eastern Europe and a historian of Jewish life in Ukraine, um, I didn't really recognize, I knew about them vaguely, but I didn't recognize quite the extent of them. And these pogroms, these massacres of Jews, took place in the very same places in which the first mass murders of the Holocaust began. It wasn't until the spring and summer of 1941 when the German army invaded the Soviet Union and started to take over Ukraine, that the mass murder of Jews fully began. This was before the death camps were established, um, and uh, these were among the very first of the, uh, of the Einsatzgruppen and killings, of the mass killings. These pogroms between 1918 and 1921 were also perpetrated by a wide array of groups as Ukraine fell into a period of civil war. Uh, the Russian Empire had just collapsed, the Tsar had, uh, had, collapsed. The Tsar had collapsed, the Bolsheviks had taken power in St. Petersburg, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire collapsed, which also included part of Ukraine. And in its place, 
all of these groups started claiming independence and started claiming sovereignty over the territory, leading to mass violence. And Jews found themselves in the middle of all of these conflicts. So at the beginning of the war, Bolsheviks, the Red Army, targeted Jews on the grounds that they were capitalists. The capitalists, the other armies, targeted the Jews on the grounds that they were Bolsheviks. The Poles, who had just declared, just declared statehood, uh, targeted Jews or suspected Jews of disloyalty and of loyalty to Ukraine. And the Ukrainians suspected them of loyalty to the Poles. The Russians targeted the Jews thinking that they were spying for the Germans, and the Germans targeted the Jews thinking they were spying for the Russians. No matter which side you were on, there was a Jew to blame, and Jews suffered as a result. I first started to recognize the extent of what Jews had undergone during these pogroms in the early 2000s when I joined a team that actually Simon mentioned in the introduction called the Archives of Historical and Ethnographic Yiddish Memories that was led by my colleague, the Yiddish linguist Dov Bear Kerler. And we went around Ukraine. We went to most of the places that you see on this map. This, by the way, is a map of where pogroms took place. I don't think I said that. Um, but you can see we went to most of these places and many other more. We visited about 100 different locales in Ukraine looking for elderly Yiddish speakers to interview them about how they survived the Holocaust and how they survived communism. And I was struck in those interviews by the role that these pogroms played in their lives. I'm going to play you clips of a few of them to show you. Um, and they also illustrate the variety of pogroms, the variety of ways in which Jews were targeted uh, during this violence. So the first is this fellow's name is Nisan Yurkovetsky, and he lives in a town or lived in a town called Tulchin. And the pogrom in Tulchin in 1919 was instigated by a local gang of toughs, the Lyachovich gang, he calls them. And they came into town, and for eight days they terrorized the town killing Jews. And he's going to describe one incident in which his family was killed. He was two years old at the time, and his mother was holding him as she was shot and killed. And the bullet that killed his mother grazed his arm and left a scar on his arm. And he's going to show us that scar. It says, this is where the bullet that killed my mother uh, grazed my arm. Um, and he was left to die in that mass grave and a Polish priest happened to be wandering by and found him and saved him. Um, but the rest of his family was killed. And he'll talk about that. The voice you hear is, is Dov Bear Curler interviewing him. And you'll see also the emphasis that we play on names, to know the names of the people who were killed. We always think this is very important to, to I guess, say their names. Um, and so I'm going to play this uh, video clip. It's in Yiddish, but it's subtitled. Shikat gaze man fute, fute gaze in shikat. Shikat nun set ni yotn, geranit, en fute mit a meta otn dragit. Men nun set ni yotn, as gebet, mi gans en zwei yotn. Oh! Ber, 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 ze dragit de... Bande Lechovic. Bande Lechovic. Elod geschossen, de bandit. Is it there you fly the pulley? At this, at semen. And the dog kicked it. Porach. Vidna, vidna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The foot of man of the shike. Yeah, yeah. That's what I've been a pike What never you fast took, Nancy and you. You've been a pike room. Into chin, and my toys guarded us on board green. 
zusammen nicht in das Ausgabe mehr Kosselille. Es ist auch ein Gordischer, ein Gordach, Berdutschan, Genosse, hat Probe der Banditen, er in seiner Tätigung gewinnt von Ladeja. Okay, so I want to just point out a few things that you hear in that interview. For one, it still impacts him. Uh, he still very much is feeling the scars of that. And this is, this interview was taken, what, 80 years or so after the event describing? Uh, and you can imagine what impact they had just 20 years later, which is when the Holocaust occurred in these same towns. I'm like, hi, I'm a little, I don't know why that's feedbacking. Uh, so you can imagine the impact and the legacy of that violence 20 years later. Second, it's intimate local violence. He knows the names of the people who perpetrated these atrocities. And he also knows the name of the people who saved him, of the Polish priest who saved him. Uh, that's also significant. And it was a type of violence that could be ended, that the priest could come and say, enough, everybody, go home. And they went home. So it's one type of violence. And we're going to see that there were a whole variety of different types of violence. But this is along the lines of what maybe we would consider a typical ethnic riot, a typical race riot, perhaps, um, is what happened in Tulchin, in the small town of Tulchin. The next uh, video I want to play you is talking about a different pogrom and a different type of pogrom. And this one took place in the town or the city, really, of Praskurov, which uh, uh, Simon had mentioned today's Chmielnitsky, uh, which was on the Soviet, or sorry, on the border between uh, Russia and Poland or between Ukraine and Poland at the time, uh, is now fully in Ukraine, at least was last I checked, um, but who knows under whose occupation it is right now. Um, but uh, there had been an attempted Bolshevik uprising in the city, and the Ukrainian army, trying to defend itself against the Bolshevik uprising, moved into town to put out the uprising. And then this military unit from the Ukrainian army went around massacring Jews door to door. And this pogrom resulted in the deaths of somewhere between 900 to 2,000 people. Uh, probably the single largest massacre of Jews ever in their history um, up until that point in time. And I'm going to play you him talking about it. So this is very different. This is a military pogrom. It's an organized pogrom perpetrated by trained military units. Uh, here we go. Oh, hang on, sometimes I also want to point out um, he's elderly. He doesn't tell the story, actually. He's the one who lived through it. It's his wife who tells the story on his behalf while he nods along, and then he adds a little bit at the end. So, given six years, <laughs> given the pogrom, given, and and the girls were saying what they want, so they want to me. Did you get in the girls? Sabor, not get in the girls. Bezant. And the ganze Gross hat nun gegen Argen Dieden. Er muss nun am Sagen Dieden. Er muss sagen, dass er sein Stieberang gibt Gold oder Ballon gibt. Er sieht ihm gleich stark Kuren, beim Gurnisch Gurnisch Gurnisch, beim Mirorben Gurnisch. Und die Gästen Gurnisch, er muss sich auch nicht an den Kopf. Na, wo ist er zu gehen in Dresden? Da haben sie nicht gewusst, da haben sie gewusst, da haben sie nur gehört. Aber geschrieben gewollt hat geschrieben. In der Zeit hat nun geben zu fahren. Wir sollen sich zu bereien, die Nachtscheißwe, so sich zu bereien. Und genau in der Bandit, wie sie sich gewollt hat, genannt. Und genau in der Schach gesagt, in der Tarn gelegt in Futter, in der Rolle gegangen. In der Zeit haben sie geblieben leben. Nur wenn sie in der Rolle gegangen sind, in der Rolle haben sie gesehen, du den Cap, and all the other people who have been in the 
and he has a match he has given Raven. So, um, I just have th this slide, which is just uh, of our website that includes these interviews as well as many other interviews similar to that. You can find on uh, our website, which is www.aheym.org. I forget. Oh, no, dot com is the one that takes you here. Um, anyway. In that interview, again, you can see it's a different type of pogrom. Uh, it is a military action. Uh, and this is also you know, one of the reasons why I think people didn't think of these pogroms as a precursor to the Holocaust, because they thought of them all as race riots rather than military actions. And recent scholarship has shown that, first of all, the Holocaust as it took place in Eastern Europe, not the death camps in Poland, in German-occupied Poland, for instance, but the killings that took place in Ukraine were also intimate killings. They were much more intimate than we had recognized. Uh, they took place uh, close at hand. The people knew each other. Um, they weren't these bureaucratized, mechanized killings that Hannah Arendt imagined. Um, and there, there was truth in that. That's how they occurred in the death camps. Uh, these were close, intimate killings, much more like the pogroms of 1918 to 1921. And at the same time, the pogroms of 1918 to 1921 were also more mechanized than we had imagined those to be. They were also perpetrated by military units um, deliberately targeting Jews. And we know about the numbers of the Prescura pogrom, for instance, from charts like this, that in the immediate aftermath of these acts of violence, lawyers and activists went around town and collected the names of people who were killed for posterity's sake and in the hopes that they would be able to bring the perpetrators to justice. And so this is a list of 911 names. This is the last page of the list. These are the names of the people killed that were recorded in the immediate aftermath of, the, of that pogrom. If we take all of the lists of every town that were assembled, we get about 33,000 names. So we have about 33,000 names. And in 1921, the Soviet government, after it established control in the area, did a kind of statistical survey where they went around trying to see how accurate these lists were. And they discovered that the lists, in their estimation, accounted for about a third of the total number of victims. Uh, so that's why we give the figure of 100,000 um, as the number of people killed. Uh, it's an estimate. Uh, we can't know exact numbers, but somewhere between, I think, a low of 40,000 and a high of 100,000 um, is the total number of people killed during these pogroms. So after hearing accounts like this and recognizing what had actually gone on at this time, I started to wonder why no one was talking about them. Uh, why there aren't many books about these pogroms, why I didn't grow up knowing about them, why I thought the Holocaust came out of nowhere. Again, these are just 20 years before the Holocaust um, in the same places. And I started going through newspapers during the interwar period and realized that actually at the time, everybody was talking about it. This is an article from the New York Times, for instance. Ukrainian Jews aim to stop pogroms. It's about a rally that was taking place in New York. Mass meeting here is that 127,000 Jews have been killed and 6 million are in peril. I want to show you the last line of this article. This fact from 1919, September 8, 1919, this fact that the population of 6 million souls in Ukraine and in Poland have received notice through action and by word that they are going to be completely exterminated, this fact stands before the whole world as the paramount issue of the present day. And this is not some you know, isolated incident that I discovered. In fact, when you go through newspapers of this period, you can see Everybody is talking about the coming destruction of the Jews in Ukraine and Poland. Um, 
short writers are writing short stories about it, or even whole novels about it. Painters are painting portraits of it, or painting images, or doing, you know, doing work inspired by the pogroms. And activists are writing about it as well. I'll give you some other examples. This is an ad for a special issue of the issue of the Literary Digest called Will a Slaughter of Jews Be Next European Horror? Um, this is a quote from the Russian Red Cross, which prepared a big report on these pogroms and concluded, the task of the pogrom movement, said itself, uh, was to rid Ukraine of all Jews and to carry out, in many cases, by the wholesale physical extermination of the race. That's from 19, uh, 1921, I think that report comes from. Uh, Emma Goldman, the uh, Russian-American Jewish anarchist, who was in Ukraine at the time, actually, um, wrote about the wholesale slaughter of the Jews. And the French writer and activist Anatole France wrote that the pogroms threatened the Jews with complete extinction. And this is where the title of my book comes from. He says, in the very midst of civilized Europe, at the dawn of a new era, the existence of a whole population is threatened. Um, and this is from The Nation, also 1921, The Murder of a Race. Uh, as though searching for the word genocide that had not yet been invented, but genocide means murder of a race, and this is exactly what he's talking about um, in 1919. So when uh, Anatole France here is talking about in the midst of civilized Europe and the dawn of a new era, I want to talk briefly about why he called it a dawn of a new era, because the irony is that this was happening in Ukraine. And Ukraine in 1917 to 1919 was regarded by many Jews around the world as a model state, as the most liberal, most favorable to Jewish states um, in Europe. Uh, because they had a government that granted Jews national autonomy, uh, which meant that Jewish communities would be responsible for managing their own schools, managing even aspects of judicial affairs, would get allocations from the state budget to support their own schools and their own orphanages and their own old age homes in Yiddish. Yiddish was made one of the official languages of Ukraine. And in fact, here you can see currency um, printed in, on the front side, which I'm not showing you here. It's in Ukrainian, and on the back it's in Russian, Polish, and Yiddish. I think probably the first time ever in history that, you, that currency banknotes have been printed with Yiddish on them uh, was done in Ukraine in 1918 uh, by the Ukrainian government. And they even established a cabinet level ministry of Jewish affairs to ensure that Jews as a national minority were represented in the, uh, um, in the Ukrainian cabinet. And actually Simon has written quite a lot about this and knows even more about this than I do about this moment of uh, national autonomy in Ukraine. Um, this just to give you an example, Der Tog, which was the newspaper out of New York, talking about the independence of Ukraine, wrote that for the first time in all Jewish history, the Jewish people will be recognized by a government as an equal part of the general population, not only in a civil political sense, but in a national sense. So this was a regime that really was promising broad autonomy, equity, and equality um, to all of the national minorities living within Ukraine. It's a model um, that I think remains an aspirational model for Ukraine. Um, the fact is, though, that that state didn't last. Very quickly, that state crumbled in advance of, get this, a Russian invasion. Um, in fact, several Russian invasions. There was an invasion by the Bolsheviks out of Moscow, and there was an invasion by the uh, Russian White Army, which was an army trying to restore a version of the Tsarist Empire, of the Imperial Russian Empire. And so they were attacked from both sides, as well as from Poland on the west, and the whole state crumbled after a few months. Uh, so that's when this war was taking place, during which the pogroms uh, occurred. This is an image of a uh, shop in the town of Zhitomyr after a pogrom. And I want to use it to talk about why this all crumbled, where we got this violence from. I just told you that there was a you know, liberal government promising these broad social rights, um, but yet it all crumbled. And one of the main reasons for violence against Jews, at least in the early stages of the pogroms, was simply loot. In Ukraine, the cities or the urban centers tended to be Jewish, and the outskirts of towns and the provinces and rural areas tended to be Ukrainian. 
And in many towns, all of the stores, eat literally all, or sometimes 90%, 80%, um, but a vast majority of the stores were owned by Jews. That tended to be the occupation the Jews did in Ukraine. In fact, in Ukraine, people would refer to a store owner as a Jew. They were almost interchangeable. Uh, urban, somebody who lived in the city was a Jew, a store owner. They would say, you know, go to the Jew to get a, uh, you know, to get some produce or whatever. Not in a derogatory way, but because that's the people who sold produce. Um, not so strange, in fact, in many places in, you know, the American South and the American West also, uh, in small towns, stores tended to be owned by Jews. Um, but certainly that was the case in Ukraine. And during a period of war and starvation and hunger, when peasants are in desperate need of provisions, those provisions are housed in the stores in the city. So they would come into the city and raid the stores, which the Jews interpreted as a pogrom. They defended their stores and often were killed defending those stores. And the peasants who were going in um, regarded it as getting their fair due or just feeding their families. Soldiers, this Ukrainian military, and the other militaries, by the way, also fighting in the region, these were states that had literally just been established months earlier. They couldn't feed their army, so they would tell their soldiers, if you can take this city, then you know, feed yourselves by raiding the city. Even clothing, they would say, the army couldn't provide the soldiers with clothing, so it would say, raid the leather shops and that's how you'll get your clothing. That's how you'll get new boots. So the armies would come in and they would carry out provisions or, or requisitions rather um, in the town and a requisition was a pogrom to the Jews who experienced it. Um, so many of the early pogroms were this type of violence, raiding the liquor stores that were owned by Jews, raiding the leather plants that were owned by Jews, raiding the dry goods stores, the produce stores, whatever it may be um, that happened to be owned by Jews. But then over time, the violence also started to take on a political tone. And that political tone was primarily an association between Jews and Bolshevism. And that became the most powerful uh, key in this violence, was the idea that Jews are Bolsheviks. And it was perpetrated by propaganda, um, by the white armies and by others who tried to portray the Bolsheviks as Jews. You can see it in this image, for instance, which is called the Coat of Arms of Lev Trotsky. Leon Trotsky, a name that some of you may have heard, was the head of the Soviet Red Army. He was also the, the Commissar of Foreign Affairs of the Soviet Union. Uh, you may know Vladimir Lenin as the head of the Soviet Union, but at the time, the person who really represented the Soviet government to the Western world was Leon Trotsky. Um, even to the Ukrainian peasants, to the people on the street, Leon Trotsky was the revolution to a lot of people, more, was the face of the revolution more than Lenin. Um, somebody had just mentioned, I saw on Twitter, uh, somebody had said, can you imagine uh, about Volodymyr Zelensky right now, can you, could our grandparents ever have imagined that a Jew would be leading an army in Ukraine? And I thought, actually, uh, Trotsky led an army in Ukraine as well, uh, so he, he isn't the first. Uh, but anyway, this is a portrayal of Trotsky. It's uh, as the coat of arms of Leon Trotsky. It's a perversion of the Russian imperial eagle. Um, you can see that the face has very stereotypical Jewish facial attributes, um, hooked nose, thick lips, uh, wearing a skull cap, a star of David in the middle, and says Talmud. So the white army used these to try to discredit the Bolsheviks. Why did they need, and actually I'll show you one more. Um, this is Christ being led uh, to the cross, and he's being chased by Red Army soldiers and sailors. And then at the bottom, you see Leon Trotsky looking on. And so this gives the impression that it's the Bolsheviks who killed Christ. And to most uh, Christian peasants of the time, they associate the Jews as the killers of Christ. So this is a way of using old-style anti-Semitic tropes and applying them to the New Age. So why did they need to do this? This is pretty simple, because the Russian Imperial Army wanted to reestablish Tsarism, or a version of Tsarism, whereas the Bolsheviks were promising the peasants land, bread, and peace. And land, bread, and peace are pretty good. So peasants generally wanted land, bread, and peace, but the way that you discredit them um, is by saying, you know, these people promising you land, bread, and peace, they're not real, they're just Jews and they're gonna, 
uh, and they're going to rip you off like Jews always do, or they're not going to give you the land, they're not going to give you the bread, they're not going to give you the peace. And so this was a way of co-opting the peasants by accusing them, uh, or by accusing the Bolsheviks of being Jewish. And it worked, because Leon Trotsky also, as the head of the Red Army, I'm going to skip this for now, um, actually I'll keep it for a sec, Leon Trotsky as the head of the Red Army stomped down on anti-Semitism in his ranks and stop, stomped down on, uh, on pogroms. I just want to show you this chart, which is a chart of who the perpetrators of pogroms were. And you can see it says the Poles perpetrated 38, the Ukrainians 54, the Russian Imperial Army 93, and bands 509. It says peasant bands. So these are like the peasant bands that threatened Tulchin, the first town that I showed you. And who were these peasant bands? Um, here you see images of one of the most notorious peasant bands of the time, uh, the Ilya Struk warlords. And they're posing in a photographic studio with clothing that doesn't fit them, you know, uniforms that are way too big on them, on a toy horse. And they're dressed up as Cossack warriors, but they're not. They're really just peasant kids. And this is who the perpetrators of many of the pogroms were, were neighborhood toughs. They were these kids who were 16, 17, 18 years old at the time in 1919. They had grown up their entire lives in a period of war. The First World War was fought in large part over Ukraine. Um, their parents, instead of farming the land, had been out fighting uh, and had traded in their plowshares for, uh, for swords. And this is all that these kids knew. And so they try to emulate them by joining these paramilitary organizations or insurgent bands. And the insurgent bands were wreaking havoc with no particular ideology, but were perpetrating most of these pogroms, just ordinary young peasants. Um, so I want to say, the, again, back to the Red Army, that the Red Army put an end to these pogroms and didn't let its soldiers perpetrate pogroms. And in fact, the Red Army tried to kick out these peasant warlords. And they would go into town after town. So a town would be terrorized by peasant warlords, like Tulchin. For eight days, he says it was terrorized by peasant warlords. In that case, he says the priest kicked them out. But more often than the priest, it was the Red Army that kicked them out. And the Red Army would come into town and would liberate the Jews literally would gather all the Jews around. Every other army came into town, whoops, every other army came into town, gathered the Jews into the center of town, and marched them to the outskirts of town where they killed them. The Red Army alone gathered Jews in the center of town and said to them, we have saved you. We've killed or kicked out the bandits who were terrorizing you, and now we want you to join us and go liberate the next village. And they did. And so Jews joined the Red Army en masse, recognizing this was the, their best means of self-defense, thereby perpetuating this notion that Jews are Bolsheviks. Because the, as more and more Jews joined the Bolshevik army, the myth that Jews and Bolsheviks are interchangeable became more and more um, apparent to town after town after town. Uh, and what the Red Army did is prosecute pogrom perpetrators and punish pogrom perpetrators. And you see this in this sentence for the perpetrators of a pogrom in Slovichna from 1921. And you'll see this was a Soviet tribunal that was punishing those who had terrorized the village of Slovichna. And the people who led the tribunal have the names Feldman and Ratner, two very typical Jewish names. And the people that they were sentencing, this actually sentences the peasants to death. Um, you can see that the people sentenced to death are, one is 26 years old in 1921, and the other is, can't find it here, but I think he's 18 years old. I don't see it here at the moment, but anyway, the other one's 18 years old, which means they were 16 and 19 at the time that this pogrom took place. And the Soviets come in, and they round up the peasants who perpetrated these atrocities, and they kill them. They sentence them to death and kill them. What this looks like to the village is now that the Jews are in power, they're coming to our village, and they're taking our youth, and they're killing them. And you see this, actually, the historian Leonard Shapiro, who actually lived during this time, mentioned this, uh, that anyone who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the Cheka, uh, which was the organization the Cheka was a uh, precursor to the KGB, 
and was uh, the Soviet secret police and was one of the organizations that, that uh, um, administered these tribunals, uh, stood a good chance of finding himself confronted with and possibly shot by a Jewish investigator. Because the Cheka in its early days in Ukraine was focused on punishing pogrom perpetrators, on punishing people they called bandits, because they posed a great risk to Bolshevik power. These peasant warlords, these centers of power, um, these alternative you know, centers of power in the village posed a risk to the Bolsheviks. So they really focused on, um, on rounding them up and prosecuting them. And in many cases, it's Jews who joined in order to defend themselves against pogroms and to bring the perpetrators to justice who were responsible for that. Um, you can imagine 20 years later when the Nazis come in and when the Germans come in and they take over Ukraine and they say to the peasants, now is your chance to get revenge on those Jews who killed your children 20 years earlier. And you can see, as I showed you in these uh, video clips, this is local memory. People know who killed who when. Um, it's only 20 years, they're small towns, word travels. Again, you can imagine the impact that the murder of a thousand people in a town has 20 years later, um, and then the prosecution of those who did the murdering. So that's one of the ways in which I think that these pogroms are connected with the Holocaust. Another is through migration. Just like literally today, front page of the New York Times, 500,000 Ukrainians are fleeing into Poland. It's exactly what happened 1918 to 1921. There were two groups of people fleeing the Bolsheviks into, uh, first into Poland and then into Germany. And those were Jews who claimed in their memories that they were fleeing Ukrainian Cossacks and Ukrainians who claimed in their memory that they were fleeing Jewish Bolsheviks. And together, these Ukrainians and Jews ended up in the same cities, in Berlin, in Paris, in Vienna, um, in these urban areas. And they brought those conflicts from the East to, uh, to Central Europe. In addition, this wave of refugees into places like Germany led to the rise of right-wing movements in Germany and contrib or contributed to the rise of right-wing movements in Germany. Uh, they accused the refugees of importing Bolshevism. They accused them of carrying disease. They accused them of overwhelming the resources that these countries had. And so they ignited a whole movement against refugees. And among the, these are images of, uh, of refugees fleeing, and these are images of an orphanage that was established in Berlin for uh, uh, Ukrainian children who'd survived the pogroms and whose parents had been killed. Um, all of this anti-refugee movement and allegations that they were bringing Bolshevism, by the way, that took place in the United States as well. We had a Red Scare in 1919 here in the United States that was actually led out of Dearborn, Michigan, near where I live, by Henry Ford, um, who was also accusing the Jews of importing Bolshevism. Even though, remember, they were fleeing Bolshevism. That's why they were leaving uh, Ukraine, was to get out of, to, to flee Bolshevism, but nevertheless, they were accused of importing it. Um, and we, this all contributed to the rise of right-wing politics. And um, Albert Einstein, no dummy, uh, recognized this. He was living in Berlin at the time, and he recognized this as well. Said the confrontational attitude toward these unfortunate refugees who have escaped the hell that Eastern Europe is today has become an efficient and politically successful weapon used by demagogues. And in fact, you see this in the Volkische Beobachter, this is an, the newspaper that was purchased by the Nazi party in one of the very first issues after the Nazis purchased it. You can see the headline, Gegen die Ostjuden, against the Eastern European Jews. And they initiated, particularly in the early days of the Nazi party, really focused on the fear of Jews importing Bolshevism and on Judeo-Bolshevism and on the danger that immigrants were bringing. Uh, go forward 20 years, and when the Nazis then moved back into the East, moved back into Ukraine, they reignited this rhetoric with images like this. This is Jewish Bolshevism, um, is what this poster says, um, with an image of Ukrainians who had been killed by the Bolsheviks, probably on the grounds, on the grounds of banditry. And then, 
As soon as the Germans invaded Ukraine in June 1941, they started organizing pogroms just like those pogroms from 1918 to 1921, uh, getting the masses to participate in rounding up Jews and beating them up in the street in a very uh, visible way, in a carnivalesque way, uh, such as this pogrom in Lviv, uh, which is still a town, still a city in, uh, in western Ukraine. Um, and you can see they're be beating up Jews in the street. You can see people looking on. Um, it's a public participatory pogrom. And this then turned in to subsequently into a mass murder as about 3,000 Jews were killed um, by German Einsatzgruppen, um, but initiated as a pogrom. And the Germans, in instigating it, very deliberately tied it to the pogroms of 1918 to 1921, and in fact told the Ukrainians to engage in this to get your revenge for what the Jews did to you um, after the pogroms. So uh, I'll end it there. And that's um, basically, you know, the lesson of it is that this violence perpetuates itself and has a legacy. And one thing leads to the next. And I do think that we have underestimated um, the role of this particular wave of violence as one of the causes, not the only cause, but as one of the causes um, of the Holocaust. So I can take questions. Are you going to? Thanks. Um, I saw a hand over here. So my question is uh, quite simple. So Jews were, were, were so hatred throughout Europe. and. Uh, even before World Wars. So what really happened for, um, in history for, for Jews to, to really be so much hatred through, throughout the you know, groups and um, cultures? I really wanted to know why, and I did some little research online, but I couldn't find out the, the rigid reasons behind it. So I just want to know. So that's a, I mean, that's a great question. Uh, that could be and has been the topic of, you know, huge books. Uh, it requires a, a really a long detailed answer. I can give you a few things, a few hints of an answer, um, but it really would take a whole nother, I teach a class just on that question. Mm -hmm. um, so it would take even more than an entire lecture. Um, but, you know, one answer is Christianity, which is the dominant religion of Europe, was formed as a response to Judaism and emerged out of Judaism. And so the religion from its earliest days portrayed itself as succeeding Judaism, as a replacement for Judaism, and expected Judaism to fall by the wayside. And I think the continued presence of Jews in Europe was disturbing um, in that sense because the whole doctrine of Christianity was to supersede, was to overcome Judaism. So there's a, there's a doctrinaire theological component to it. And then another component is simply sociological, that for various reasons, mostly because of restrictions that were imposed on Jewish participation in the feudal system, on Jewish land ownership, Jews tended to have jobs in urban areas and tended to have jobs or tended to live in urban areas and tended to have positions that depended on trade on, and on money. And this is a time when most people didn't use money. Most wealth was based in the land, um, but some wealth was based in, uh, in currency, and Jews tended to, tended to be the currency dealers. And really, nobody likes banks. Um, nobody likes pawn shop owners. Nobody likes people who lend money. Nobody likes uh, you know, merchants. And these were jobs that were often held by Jews in Europe. So there's a lot of socioeconomic um, angst uh, as well. There's a host of other, re again, I could answer you know, in a much larger, but I think those are the two major, I think that there's a theological opposition to Judaism, there's a socio, uh, socioeconomic competition or angst towards actually present Jews in Europe. But it's a, Thank you. It's a good complicated question. And I'm sorry I didn't ask before, but maybe actually uh, going forward, we can, we, you can do what I failed to do and introduce yourself. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Dylan. I'm a first year at Northeastern. Um, my question is mainly about the migrations that you described of Ukrainians and Jews out of Ukraine during the pogroms. Uh, it's kind of a two-part question. My first part is, were these migrations side by side or one after the other? And then if they were side by side, what did these migrants think of each other? Like the Ukrainians that see Jews fleeing, 
and Jews that see Ukrainians fleeing, do they have animosity towards them or do they see each other as, as equally refugees or what is the relationship between those two refugees who, who think to be fleeing each other? Yeah, both. Um, yes to all of them. You know, there's, uh, they flee together and when they're fleeing, you know, there's, a, there's actually in the immediate aftermath of these pogroms, the Bolsheviks come into power and there's a famine in Ukraine in 1921. Uh, and so a lot of people are fleeing across the border. And just like you see right now, at that point in time, there's not much, uh, you know, everyone just wants to get across the border. And it's only after a couple of years that it really starts to emerge. Um, in the Jewish case, really between 1921 and 1923. Um, and in 1923, countries throughout Europe impose restrictions on Jews. They start to say the Jews have been here too long, they need to go back. And country after country issues various laws to expel Jews um, from Jew Jews who have just migrated from Ukraine. So they tend to be okay with them coming through, with them settling there for a few weeks, a few months. But once the migrants, once the refugees have stayed, they start to get upset. The United States is the same way, right? The National Origins Act of 1924 emerges in part out of this wave of migration. Uh, so we also restrict uh, the migration of Jews and people from South Europe who are fleeing violence. Uh, and then in the, in the communities, they settle in the same areas, literally in the same areas of these cities because they tend to be Russian speakers and they you know, have stores that sell, they want the same type of food because they were living in, uh, you know, in regions of the same food, they have the same, you know, the same infrastructure, so they do, really do tend to settle in the same area. And you know, there's a story, a famous story by the Yiddish writer David Bergelson, actually several versions of stories like this, but D David Bergelson tells a story about a uh, Jew who moves into an apartment building with a lot of other refugees from Ukraine, and then he realizes that the perpetrator of the pogrom that killed his parents lives, in the, lives the next door down or lives two doors down in the apartment building. And this was kind of a common thing, and the Ukrainian diaspora newspapers were saying one thing, and the Yiddish diaspora newspapers were saying something else. And it actually culminates in Paris in 1925. Um, I didn't mention the name Simon Petlura. He was the head of the Ukrainian state during the time, uh, kind of the president of Ukraine. And he was widely blamed for the pogroms. Um, I don't think he was responsible for them, so that's why I don't mention it. It's a whole long thing. But he was widely blamed for the pogroms. And in 1925, a Yiddish poet by the name of Sholem Schwarzbard decides that he's going to take revenge for the pogroms, and he assassinates Simon Petlura on the streets of Paris. He just sees him one day at a bookstore, recognizes him, and shoots him. And this leads to a huge sensational trial in 1926. This headlines all over the world. And he actually gets off by convincing the jury that Petlura was responsible for the pogroms and that the killing was therefore justified. Um, so it's complicated. In many cases, yes, they live side by side peacefully. In fact, in most cases, they live side by side peacefully. But there are these sporadic tensions. And particularly, that, that assassination is really key because that completely destroys relations between the two communities. Um, the, Jew, the organized Jewish community rallies around Schwarzbard, um, you know, regrettably actually, rallies around Schwarzbard and says that he was justified. And the organized Ukrainian diaspora community rallies around Petlura. The funny thing is, Ukrainians didn't like Petlura before that. Um, because he sold out, it's complicated, but he sold out parts of Ukraine to Poland. So he wasn't a hero before that, but once he got assassinated, the entire Ukrainian diaspora rallies around him, and the Jewish uh, communities rally around Schwarzbard, and it really creates a, a big rift um, between the two communities that is also a contributor to animosities in World War II. And some animosities that actually remain today. You know, Petlura has streets named after him, and there's statues of him in Ukraine, and many Jews regard that as an affront because they continue to hold him responsible uh, for the pogroms. At the same time, there are streets named Schwarzbard. Um, actually, there are streets named after Schwarzbard um, in Israel. Uh, so it works both ways. Thank you. Yeah. But good question. I'm sorry for the long answer. Hi, I'm Deanna. I'm a fourth year Jewish studies student here. Hey. Um, and I'm wondering, what is the, the common knowledge of these pogroms in Ukraine today? Are children taught about this in school as part of their country's history? How is it regarded? And is it part of the common memory of the country? Um, no. 
it kind of goes into the memory of the Civil War and what they call the Civil War. Uh, it's actually not really a civil war, this period of 1918 to 1921. As I described, it's a war of a whole bunch of different armies fighting each other. Um, and civil war implies that they're all in the same country and they're not quite all, you know, it's debatable. The part of what they're fighting over is whether they're in the same country or not. Um, so they learn about the Civil War, but they don't learn about the pogroms as part of it, just like you probably didn't learn about them as part of your education as a Jewish studies major. Um, so they haven't really, they haven't really permeated public consciousness. Um, I would like Ukraine to do a better job first teaching the Holocaust, and then we can worry about the pogroms. Um, That's a great question. Before I pass it on, you know, I'll give one little story of commentary that um, I, I posted on my Twitter feed just an announcement of um, Jeff's talk and using the flyer that gave a sort of description uh, and the title of his book. And people came out of the woodwork uh, to, to say, this is preposterous, right? Um, that how could this anti-Jewish violence in 1918 to 1921 have anything to do with the Holocaust? Where do these numbers come from? And then, you know, dropping links to all sorts of articles that suggest that there are other origins of the Holocaust, et cetera. And I was just talking to Jeff about this. I think this were actually, these were accounts of pri primarily Polish nationalists. Um, but the point is, in terms of what's being taught, um, for many, the whole idea of that there's a relationship between these things is sort of just preposterous, right? When there are so many other factors, uh, not least the fact that uh, in these people's minds, there is a continued connection between uh, communism and Bolshevism and the, the experience of whether it is Ukraine or Poland or Hungary, et cetera, um, with, these, with these things. So I apologize for taking the speaker's prerogative there, but it was, yeah. it was just related to um, the well, Twitter. Well, say, I get a lot of, I get a lot of uh, heat on Twitter. A lot of trolls go at me on Twitter, but, but nothing compared to what Jan Grabowski gets, and I saw that you have him come in in a few weeks, so I hope everyone here goes out to see him. Hi, my name is Vanessa. I'm also first year at Northeastern. Um, and my question is if, as you explained in your presentation, um, that it was such a prevalent topic in newspapers that such things were occurring, why wasn't something done to put a stop or to help um, in these situations, which then obviously led to worse issues? Yeah, that's an excellent question. And the answer I have is, um, a disturbing answer, and that's actually a lot was done. Um, I'll give you some examples of things they did. They rallied or uh, lobbied the great powers who were meeting in Paris at the time to establish constitutions for new countries, and they forced those countries to insert minority rights treaties in the constitution. So Poland and Romania had to put in minority rights clauses in their constitution as a result of Jewish lobbying because of these pogroms. So that's pretty major. They tried to establish a Jewish homeland in Palestine and started migrating and setting up the infrastructure for a Jewish homeland. Uh, they migrated by the hundreds of thousands, if not millions, out of the region, both to Germany, to the United States, to wherever they could go, as well as out of Ukraine to Moscow and St. Petersburg, the major cities in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And there, they joined the Red Army and they joined the Bolsheviks en masse in order to try to bring about justice to the pogroms and stop them. Um, they publicized it. They went around and collected lists of all of the people who were killed. They held rallies at Madison Gardens and Madison, where, where, at Madison Square Gardens and the polo fields in New York and everywhere else around the world. Um, they did everything and that wasn't enough. And that's, I think, the real tragedy. I would love to say, why didn't they do anything? Um, but the tragedy is that they did, and it wasn't enough. Thank you. Hi, I'm a third year engineering student in Northeastern. Um, my question is, 
To what extent were old ideas such as the blood libel referenced during the pogroms in this time period? Yeah, that's a great question. And I got to say, I haven't seen any references to the blood libel in them. I think this is one of the reasons that this is a new style of violence against Jews. It's no, this, and this is why I start the book in 1918 rather than, say, in 1903 or 1881. Um, the 1881 pogroms were stimulated by the rumors that the Christian child had been killed by a Jew for ritual purposes. Uh, 1903, Kishinev was motivated that way. Um, these pogroms weren't. They utilized some motifs from anti-Semitic uh, ideas like the uh, Jews as Christ killers. Uh, but that specific, um, you know, those, uh, it's, it's modern reasons for killing Jews rather than age-old superstitions. That's why I think it's kind of categorically different. That's an excellent question. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Uh, excellent, excellent presentation. I teach political science, right. William Miles here at Northeastern. I, I was uh, amazed by the interviews, contemporary interviews of survivors of the pogroms uh, or, or, the, or the killings uh, of World War II in Ukraine today. Uh, could you speak about um, how many um, Jews remained in Ukraine, uh, why they uh, remained, uh, what kind of family lives, uh, Jewish lives um, uh, are there? And you mean like today, re remain or remain? Yes. Today, yeah. today remain. Yeah. yeah remain. Um, so we don't know. The last census in Ukraine was conducted in 2001. And it counted about 100,000 Jews. Um, estimates now are, the last estimate I saw was from 2016 of about 56,000, and I say about 40,000 core Jews. And by that, um, they mean people who identify as Jews and participate in Jewish communal life. So people who go to a synagogue, who commemorate the Holocaust, who have an association with Israel, who it's, who's in some way affiliate with the Jewish community. In addition to those core numbers, there's probably about four times that who have Jewish ancestry of some type. Um, so who have a Jewish grandparent or have a Jewish parent, but don't affiliate with the Jewish community. Um, because of this suppression of all religions under the Soviet Union, um, because of widespread intermarriage over the years, uh, there's you know, a large number who don't identify as Jewish, but according to Jewish law, according to halakha, would be considered Jewish, and according to the law of return in Israel, would be considered Jewish, um, but they don't themselves identify as Jewish. So somewhere between, depending on how you count today, there's somewhere between 40,000 and 200,000. And there is Jewish communal life. I mean, there's a, there are organizations that are you know, actively encouraging Jewish communal life for those who remain, um, many of whom are elderly and continue to go to synagogue. Um, by the way, same thing in the United States, though synagogue attendance is down and it's uh, often elderly people who are going to synagogue, um, at least in non-Orthodox circles. Um, so yeah, there is still Jewish communal life, there's Jewish organizations, there's Jewish cultural organizations um, that are active in Ukraine. There's a, you know, for that, those numbers, there's a fairly vibrant Jewish communal life. Uh, it's also a major site of Hasidic pilgrimage, um, where there are graves of tzaddikim uh, that are around, so there's often pilgrimage groups that go. And then a lot of Jews since the collapse of the Soviet Union and Ukrainian independence in 1991 have emigrated to Israel or to America or to Germany and retain links in Ukraine. So the numbers are also difficult to determine because a lot of people are back and forth. Um, a lot of people say go to Israel, spend a few years there, decide it's not for them, um, come back to Ukraine, or gain expertise of some type in Israel that they decide they could bring back to Ukraine. Um, particularly, you know, this was in their early days, you know, maybe 20 years ago, uh, when there weren't many private businesses in Ukraine, and people could go to Israel, learn how to run a business, and then bring that expertise back to Ukraine and build businesses and build, you know, build middle class. And a lot of them, you know, a lot of Ukrainians have grandchildren in uh, the United States or grandchildren in, uh, in Israel or brothers or sisters. There's a lot of, you know, families that have, uh, uh, you know, family members in Germany, Israel, America. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question. Yes. And will you find uh, Yiddish speakers in 10 years anymore in Ukraine? No. no. There's, uh, yeah, 
No, they're not speaking Yiddish anymore. Not in Ukraine. Well, the Orthodox are, right. Are there any more questions? Oh, OK. Hi, I'm Avery. I'm a first year here at Northeastern. Um, and I just had a question um, about the stab in the back myth. I'm mm -hmm. sure you are aware of that. Um, I know that it was more of Germany's way of rallying people um, to their cause that they lost the war because of the Jews um, stabbing them in the back. Do you know if that played a role in this animosity towards Jews in Ukraine, or was it more of a Western um, way of rallying people to Hitler's side 20 years later? Yeah, so the particular phrasing of stabbing in the back and the particular ideology that relates to Germany and only Germany, it's the myth that Germany was defeated not on the battlefield but at home. Uh, so that's where it comes from. Nevertheless, that general idea of blaming the Jews for political losses, that's very familiar um, in Eastern Europe and Ukraine and was definitely one of the major causes of the pogroms. Um, and also was one of the major sources of animosity during World War II, was blaming Jews for political losses. Um, but the particular formulation of that stab in the back, I think, is particularly uh, German. German. Okay, thank you. Yeah. That's a good question. First, I just want to thank you. This was the most compelling, mesmerizing, um, you know, talk on history. You accomplished so much in such a short space of time and also startling, so myth-busting for even someone like me who knows this region and stories well. I guess I teach narrative um, and I, for me the, the narrative theory piece of this <laughs> is um, just endlessly disturbing. It's a story of contradictory stories that are fixed on one people, and the contradictions are visible, and yet it doesn't matter. It's a story of competing narratives that are parallel and exist simultaneously in time and place by neighbors who are not enough in communication to see, to, for it to be visible. I think of the Palestinian and the Jewish narratives that are, that they don't, you know, there's no sort of acknowledgement of the parallel track piece. And the, the part of your, um, of our conversation that is most heartbreaking and startling to me was your response to this question that, you know, why wasn't more done? Actually, so much was done and it didn't matter. So um, I'm left with a kind of despair, um, even in our own historical moments, I want to ask you about that. Like, is there anything to take from this for our own moment? And the other is like, what is it about these contradictory stories that we can't seem to um, make them visible in a way that will affect how people process what's happening in any moment? Yeah, well, there's a, I mean, great questions. There's a lot in there that I think you could probably answer better than I could about the competing narratives and how those work together. Um, and I will say, yes, it's despairing. And what I study is despairing. And what I write about is despairing. Um, and yes, it is, is the answer to that. As of, I'll answer your, you know, thoughts for today. And that's kind of, you know, violence has to stop and is not the means of solving this. The war leads to unexpected circumstances. I don't think anybody expected this type of violence when the First World War began or when, this, when the so-called Russian Civil War began, um, also, again, instigated by Russian invasions, that there's unintended consequences, and it is usually civilians uh, who suffer as a result of it, um, as well as the whole country. So, you know, I don't have any particular hopeful things, except, you know, there's, there is always hope, and let us hope for peace in Ukraine, and hope that this absolutely atrocious, terrible invasion comes to an end very soon. And, you know, there are many, uh, there are many organizations that you can all give to and you can all help out with that are trying to help civilians in Ukraine. Um, you know, for, for the, the Joint Distribution Committee, which is helping Jewish 
uh, organizations in Ukraine, I think, is one that I'll mention specifically because of the context that I'm in. But I would encourage people to go out and do what you can because Ukraine right now is on the front lines of defending the democratic world um, against a possible collapse of that entire, uh, entire democratic system that we have all grown up in. And they're on the front lines. So um, whatever we can do to help them. So thanks. I'm, I'm going to give Professor Nieves uh, the final question uh, before I let everyone go. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks so much. Um, you know, I've, I've been intrigued by the silences in the archive that seem to come across in your talk. And I'm wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about w what exactly were the range of sources you used as a historian. You talk about the oral histories. We saw some of the newspaper evidence, the photographs. But what are some of the other sources that you used to, to sort of tell this narrative um, that's so compelling? And, and I'm just kind of curious about those that sort of give us the, those silent moments that we can't always sort of uh, find out, can't, can't really get, get to. Yeah, so the, the main sources for it are basically three, set, three or four sets of testimonies, depending on how you count. One is these lawyers and activists who I mentioned in the immediate aftermath of pogroms went around to uh, collect names. They also collected testimonies. So there's thousands of testimonies, literally thousands of testimonies, tens of thousands even of, tes of individual testimonies about what happened in towns that were taken in the immediate aftermath of the pogroms. Then. There's a whole nother set of testimonies that were taken by the Joint Distribution Committee in Warsaw from refugees. Uh, so those were taken a little bit later. And sometimes we have uh, testimonies from the same person taken both in the immediate aftermath and then again in Warsaw, and you can compare them and compare how they're talking. There's a third round of testimonies in these 1921 to 1923 or so uh, revolutionary tribunals that went around, and they also took testimonies about what happened. And then there's another fourth wave of testimonies uh, after the uh, Schwarzbard assassination of Petlura. The Schwarzbard Defense Fund, as well as the Petlura Defense Fund, both went in and took uh, testimonies, took a whole round of testimonies as well. So there's four rounds of testimonies taken by different groups at different points in time. And the main sources are kind of triangulating those together. Uh, in addition, there's memoirs you know, that tell a, a slightly different version, memoirs from both sides, memoirs of soldiers, memoirs of, uh, um, uh, memoirs of victims, memoirs of observers, of aid workers um, that also help fill in the picture. So this has, this has been a really wonderful uh, event. And I, I thank everybody for being here in person and virtually. I'm especially gratified by the wonderful student questions we had. Yeah. Um, that, that they were all excellent, and I really appreciate you being here and contributing, and, and hopefully, hopefully we all uh, learned. I also encourage you to buy this excellent book. There are so many things that I want to talk to Professor Weidlinger about that are in, tell you about that are in the book. Um, that we didn't uh, get to. Uh, so in place of that, um, I'll, I can just urge you to purchase it um, and email me about it and we'll, we'll have coffee. Um, so thank you all so much uh, for coming. Thank you, Professor Weidlinger, thank you for, uh, for being here. And um, let me just briefly tell you about the two events. I'm not holding the flyer for it at the moment that we have uh, coming up. Uh, in the same Morton Lecture Series, um, which are uh, the Nazis of Co Copley Square, the Forgotten History of the Christian Front. We're having Charles Ga Gallagher from Boston College come uh, on Monday, March 21st. Um, and then on April 7th, we are having Jan Grabowski, which Professor Weidlinger uh, mentioned, who's coming to talk about uh, both the memory of the Holocaust in Poland and the legal strategies of the Polish government uh, to suppress that memory. Uh, and he's talking about from Holocaust denial to Holocaust distortion, the state-sponsored attack on the memory of the Holocaust in Poland. So I encourage you all to be there again in person uh, or if you can't be virtually. Thank you all so much and good night.